using this. Because you can remove the other one. You can't put it behind if you're going to use this. Both of them got to be on this. So you can clip it off and give it to the next guy. I'll stay, I'll stay the mic. Okay. I'll stay the mic. Okay. I'll be fine. We need to change our batteries though. Gotta give the next guy this. That's fine. You need to like freeze this. I'm gonna sing it right now. This. And you wanna take my power point? Hmm? You wanna put my power point? Huh? I'm gonna try to, I don't wanna mess it up. Um, so when are we gonna do this? This is, this is the only time. I mean, I can just play it. Oh, I see what you're talking about. I'll figure it out. Hold on. We need to change out. We need to change out. So instead of once it's set, yeah. it would be first, the next guy would be second, the next guy would be third, then mine would be last. And it would be already in the computer, so we'd have to stop the computer. You know where Lance is? No. I look for him. Okay. Thank you for your comments today. Yes. If you have questions, about, I had never heard that before, but you can talk with them here all Sykes about that. Yeah, I also had a question about there's, I don't know the elders here. I have my quarterlies that I normally we do Sabbath study on games, but with the quarterly, mm -hmm. and I was hearing here that there's some error in the quarterly, and I wanted to know exactly if someone could show me like what they mean. I was kind of confused. Yeah, there is um, there is error in some of the quarterlies for sure. Um, I'm not sure about this one in particular, but we have seen it in the past. We were using the quarterly for for quite a while and. And there are just some blatant, blatant stuff in there. You can talk to Errol Sykes about that as well. Okay. But yeah, just we're so actually we're actually going to be switching over to the quarter. I think it is next um, this next year because Heartland Institute has their own um, lesson study based upon. Is it, no, it's not Heartland. Sorry, it's not Heartland. It's um, New York New York Ministry. Have you heard of that New York Men's Ministry? I think is what it's called. Is out of the um, New York Conference, I believe, but they had their own set of notes and study based upon the quarterly, and we're going to go to that okay. instead. But yeah, make sure you talk to Brother Sykes about that. I just sent you some pictures I wanted to show, but it's all right. Don't worry about it. You sure? Yeah. It's just... Don't worry. It's all right. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. When did you send them to me? Hmm? When did you send them to me? Same time you and I spoke. Really? Yeah. Was I at Dan's then? Huh? Was I at Dan's? I'm not sure. I sent it off. I know I sent you. Yeah. I sent it out from the phone because I was up in up in the room.
stars of the skies, their courses above. I just got a call from Ron and they said they can hear your lives. Join with all nature. They, can they can't hear it? They can hear it. That's good. We're talking. Oh, that's not good. To thy gratefulness, to thy mercy.
single line there. Hymn number 251. And the reason why we're single minded is because it's he that is doing it in. Hallelujah. It's he that's doing it in me. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say.
Heavenly Father, as we come, I do want to thank you once again for bringing us all here this morning. And I pray to you, Lord, that as we talk about religious liberty, that we understand that we are in some serious times. And we're seeing signs all around us that if, if one case is lost, religious freedoms are, are vanishing right before our eyes. One case is all it takes, dear Lord, and you're holding the winds of strife back. And we pray, dear Lord, that you will be with this church, be with all those who are going to be taking part in this religious liberty Sabbath. For we ask in your name. Amen. Let's turn our hymn to number 522. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest fame, no fame on earth, but I only lean on what? On Jesus' name, number 522. Wednesday. 
Uh, church membership. I don't uh, often uh, mention this, but sometimes we have individuals that come for a year before they decide to change their membership. You can do it sooner than that. Uh, you can do it after a few weeks. So uh, if, you're, if you've been coming uh, for a few weeks or a few months and you're interested in changing your membership, you can contact this lady by the name of Cynthia Euler. She's sitting right up here, uh, and she'll take care of you. <clears throat> All right, so uh, one more announcement before we go to the, uh, uh, to the offertory. Uh, prison ministry. I need a meeting of all those who are in prison ministry for five to ten minutes right before we eat after this service, okay? So we've got a critical meeting that we have to uh, talk about some very important things. So everyone who's in prison ministry needs to be there. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. we got one more announcement before we go to the office. called New Start, and we know those are the eight laws of health. That luncheon will be a day where we're going to learn about um, natural remedies, how to eat raw. You'll get recipes, you'll get all type of things to help with health. We are partnering with Hope Evangelism, and so Harold will be speaking that day, and we actually have a class after the Sabbath, so we'll can be continuing. So we want to invite all of you to come. It's going to be a day of just blessings. And so tell your friends, we'll announce this once a week, we'll try to have it up on the screen, and we just ask that you all come out and partake. And of course, if you want to have any donations, we'll take those also. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all there, and like I said, it's going to be a blessing. Thank you. Okay, for our offertory, I'm going to read from Councils on Stewardship, page 20. And it reads, God is not dependent upon men for the advancement of his cause. He might have made angels the ambassadors of his truth. He might have made known his will as he proclaimed the law from Sinai with his own voice. But... In order to cultivate a spirit of benevolence in us, he has chosen to employ men to do this work. Are we ready for this work, brothers and sisters? Every act of self-sacrifice for the good of others will strengthen the spirit of beneficence in the giver's heart, allowing him more closely to the Redeemer of the world who was rich yet for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. And it is only as we fulfill the divine purpose in our creation that life can be a blessing to us. All the good gifts of God to man will prove only a curse unless he employs them to bless his fellow men and for the advancement of God's cause in the earth. Will the deacons please come forward? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we have just read, you could have done all of this without us. You could have spoken it with your own voice. You could have used the angels. But for our benefit, you have chosen us to be your ambassadors. Help us today, dear God, to have the love of Jesus in our hearts for everyone that we come in contact with. And we pray today that we can be cheerful givers of our tithes and offerings. And we ask that you will bless these funds and direct them to their intended use. For we ask this in the name of Jesus.
27. Um, I have been doing a study on what is love, and it has taken me in some great places. And so I want to just share just a thought, a few thoughts that I've um, am uncovered as I've done this study. The first thing is I said, what is love? And so I went to Patriots and Prophets, and I found the story of Enoch. The infinite, unfathomable love of God through Christ became the subject of Enoch's meditation day and night. And with all the fervor of his soul, he sought to reveal that love to the people among whom he dwelt. Enoch walked with God, was not in a trance or a vision, but in all the duties of his daily life. In the family and in his intercourse with men, as a husband and a father, a friend, a citizen, he was steadfast, unwavering, a servant of the Lord. What about Jesus' love? Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and a death of shame. He who was rich in heaven's priceless treasures became poor, that through his poverty we might be rich. We are all to follow the path that he trod. What about you and I? Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. By yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with a power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast. And thus, through constant surrender to God, you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. That steps to Christ's consecration. The Christian is ever to realize that he has consecrated himself to God and that, in character, he is to reveal Christ to the world. It should be our aim to do all the kindness possible to those around us. Kind words are never lost. Jesus record them as if spoken to himself, our high calling. Love for souls for whom Christ died means crucifixion of self. And so as I looked for the meaning of love, truly it is dying to self, and to love God above all things, and in turn we will love each other, and we should love each other. And I, for one, I love you. So I want to say that, and I want to go on the record. And I want us all to be in heaven. So let's keep our minds in heavenly places, and let's be our brother's keeper. Let's pray for one another. And let's truly die to self because we can see all these things that's going on in the world. And when we come together, we should be a family. We should come to church to be help to each other. And then we should take whatever we get on the Sabbath and take it through the week and help those we encounter. So are there any unspoken prayer requests? Let us go there, please. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we give thanks and praises to you. And I thank you, Father, because Jesus thought heaven was not a place to be without all of us. And he saw each of our faces. And Father, we thank you that you are so loving and so kind, and we are not deserving. So Father, please help us. Help us to truly die to self and to understand what it means to love. Let us really give our hearts to you, Father. So today, we ask you to take our hearts where we cannot give them and make them pure. Please, Father, please make us pure and holy, that we can trust you with all our heart and lean not unto our own understanding, but in all our ways to acknowledge you, so that we can live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God. We ask you, Father, to please help us to learn what it means to die to self that we can be about our Father's business. Life is short and we know that, Father, but you are looking for a people that are gonna rightly represent you. And Father, we must be consecrated to you, to this work. And there's so much we have to do. Father, please take our hearts. Please recommit us, re re remake us, Father. Let us go back to our first love. Let us remember what it was when we first came in this truth, that power that we had, because we want to tell the whole world about Jesus. Amen. Father, we have to go back to the beginning, yes. and we have to really give our hearts to you, and yes. we need to understand what that means. If we truly study the life of Jesus, we would know what love is. Mm -hmm. Enoch showed himself to, be, to know what God is, and all the different patriarchs in the, in the Bible, they are there for us, Father, so that we would know. And if we truly love one another, we would not want to be in heaven without our family, our church family, the family we work with, the family we live with. We should be 
on fire for souls, Father, and it's time, it's past time. So Father, please take our hearts, recreate it, revive us, creating us a clean heart and renewing us a right spirit, and help us, Father, to trust you with all our heart and lean up unto our own understanding. Our understanding is not your understanding. Your ways are not our ways. We must come up higher. We must have a higher experience so that we can do this work in the name of the Lord. And so, Father, today, we ask you, please, help us to be consecrated, to be renewed. Help us, Father, to go and have a revival heart. I pray for religious liberty today, Father. It is about unity, truly, unity in love. We must have that love and faith worth it by love. And without it, Father, Without faith, we cannot please you. Without love, we cannot please you. And so no matter what we do to prepare for these last days, if we don't love Christ, we will not go through it. And so, Father, today, renew us and refresh us. And so I pray for each person that's going to speak today about religious liberty. What a time, such a time as this for this to happen. And it was not by chance, Father. And we know we need what you have for us today. So we ask you, Father, to be with each speaker and give him, Father, what we need. Open our hearts and help us, Father, to be able to receive. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will go through this church today, that we will not leave as we came. And I pray, Lord, that today we will truly surrender all to you and we will overcome sin because we know by the blood of the Lamb all things are possible. And so, Father, we ask you to forgive us for sin. Help us to understand the sinfulness of sin. Help us to know that it separates us from you. And Father, you have written in your word that eyes have not seen, neither have ears heard, neither have men's heart entered into men's heart the thing that God has prepared for them that love him. Let us keep our mind on heavenly things in heavenly places so that we can walk in this world in a place of higher calling, letting people see Christ and not us. And if we have hurt anybody, let's go back and fix it. Yes. And if we are holding a grudge, let us let go of it. Yes. We gotta remember, Father, it is not the people that do things to us that we should be angry at, it is Satan. Yes. And we should pray instead of talking. Yes. Let us pray more, Father, that we can really finish this work. And so I thank you, Father, for hearing and answering these prayers. Yes. You saw the unspoken prayer request, Father, and you know who they are and what they are. And I pray, Father, that you will work mildly for each person. Yes. Once again, Father, forgive us for our sins, and we thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray to you. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Once again, good morning and happy Sabbath. See some friends out here. Glad you guys came to join us. You know, this, this, um, this happened probably about several months ago. With all the things going on in the world, we started thinking to ourselves, wouldn't it be nice if we were to present to the church a whole Sabbath on religious freedom? Because this will awaken us, it should awaken us, to realize the days that we're in. And so we all got together and we talked about it. And we decided to have this Sabbath as religious liberty, religious freedom. And so we have, we have not talked amongst ourselves as what we're going to present We'll let the Holy Spirit decide how it's all going to work out, how it's all going to shape up, but I believe that you're going to be blessed. And the only problem we have right now is, is that our, um, our laptop is dead. That's not good. That's all right. We can still run without it. At least, I mean, I can run without it. No. Do we have a charger? We're going to get one? Okay, all right. So, my question is, my question is this for all of you. What does religious freedom mean to you? Have you really thought about what it means to have religious freedom? And if you have thought about it, if we go to the Constitution, we look at Amendment Number 1, you know, what does it say? Does anybody have any idea? What is, what is it? I mean, this is the most important, well, yeah, it is. It's the most important amendment that we have. Number one, what does it say? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Okay, so Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. And we're going to look at these two, um, these two parts. There is establishment of religion, and there is the free exercise thereof. And before we start, we're going to have prayer, because we're going to need it, all right? So all those that want to, can kneel with us? Yes. No. I don't think so. Is it saying so? All right, let's go ahead and have prayer.
not worrying about religious freedom, not worrying about what's coming upon us. And dear Lord, just ask us in your Holy Spirit to be with all those that are here. Try them into all truth. Something we want to go back and study so we can be prepared for what is coming. What is actually taking place right now? These are signs, dear Lord, and help us to understand what these signs mean. We ask you, Lord, that you will hide all of us behind the cliff of the rock. The only thing that the people see is your message and not the messengers. Send your Holy Spirit to be with each and every one of us. We ask in your name. Amen. Religious liberty, and how does it relate to the three angels' messages? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about the church. How does religious liberty relate to the three angels' messages? We're going to talk about the local government or the state, the nation, and finally, the world. How, does, how did all these relate to the three angels' messages? And we just went over this before. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. It says the Founding Fathers looked at liberty as inalienable. It can't be given. It can't be transferred. It can't be taken away. It is a natural right. Religious liberty was a guarantee through the right of nature to choose. Listen to this. Religious liberty is not something you get from the First Amendment. You catch that? It's not from the First Amendment. It says, it is something this country recognizes people have by birthright. This is from the First Amendment Center. So where does it come from? It comes from birthright, from the very, very beginning, when a baby is born. Just as Robert Jackson says, if there is, a, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. As I was looking at the different cases dealing with the states. I ran across a, a case where this lady, her name is Maria Goldstein, and she ordered 500 copies of some religious material that had also included in it some anti-abortion material that she was going to share with her church. And she took those to, make sure I get this right, to Office Depot, to have these printed out. Well, guess what happened? Office Depot said, no way and no how. We're not going to do it. The reason for this was, it says that they termed the information that talked about Planned Parenthood, talked about abortions, anti-abortions, as being hate speech. Now think about that for a second. If, if I want to present a message on the Three Angels, I'm going to talk about other churches, I'm going to talk about other peoples, that could be considered as hate speech. Now, 
she, she got nowhere. She got absolutely nowhere. They said, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna let you print it. And so she got involved with the Thomas More Society. And I'm only bringing that up because that's who she used to defend her. And when it all came out in the wash, this is what it says. And I'm skipping a lot of stuff because I only have 15 minutes. In a letter dated September 11, 2015, this happened not very many years ago. It says, Executive Vice President and Chief Legal Officer wrote, Upon reflection, we believe that reasonable minds may differ on whether the flyer is in violation of the policy, and in, and in this case, we should have found a way to fulfill Ms. Goldstein's order. The letter concluded with an apology to Goldstein and an invita invitation to allow them to fulfill her order, which she did. Guess what? If she would have lost this case, this would have been a case that now if you were to go to one of these places and have something printed out, they could now use this case against you. That's how close we are, brothers and sisters. We're very, very close. There's another case. This is what I already explained. How many recognize this guy? Eric Walsh, right? And this has to do with the state of Georgia. Eric Walsh um, was a He was in the public health. He had many advanced degrees. He served as the director of the city of Pasadena's public health department and was also appointed president of Obama's presidential advisory council on HIV and AIDS. He also served as a pastor of Pasadena, I believe it was Pasadena Seventh-day Adventist Church. So he, he quit his job in some fashion in California and he got a job here in Georgia. And someone had heard some comments that he had been presenting in a message against homosexuality. So what does he do? He accepts the position, and these people that had heard about this, they demanded that he give them his, all his sermons that they could go through what he'd been preaching about. Now think about that for a second. If any of us get up here and, and start speaking, and we speak about things that the general public does not believe in or accept, we could very well lose our job. But praise God, it didn't work out that way for the state of Georgia. In the state of Georgia, they went after him. He sued them. And, you know, I don't quite understand why he did not use religious liberty for the Seventh-day Adventist. I don't understand that. He ended up using a group called First Liberty Institute. All right? And First Liberty Institute has over a 90% win rate. And they deal with all kinds of religions. It's not just, it's not just one. It's all of them. Muslims, Jewish, you name it. Christian, you name it. All of them. And guess what happened? They won the case, and they had to pay, in the discrimination lawsuit, $225,000. Once again, if they would have lost this case, it becomes very serious for those that stand up front and present. Brothers and sisters, we are that close. We're that close. He was fired for what he preached. Think about that. I want to read this very quickly as I close. It says, the light that Christ revealed to his servant, the prophet, is for us. In his revelation, 
are given the three angels' messages and a description of the angel that was to come down from heaven with great power, lightening the earth with his glory. In it are warnings against the wickedness that would exist in the last days and against the mark of the beast. It continues. We are not only to read and understand this message, but to proclaim it with no, no what? It says no uncertain sound to the world. By presenting these things revealed to John, we shall be able to stir the people, the usual subjects on which the ministers of nearly all other denominations dwell will not move them. Continues. We must proclaim our God-given message to them. The world is to be what? It is to be warned about what? Warned by the proclamation of this message, the three angels' messages. If we blanket it, if we hide our light under a bushel, if we so subscribe ourselves that we cannot reach the people, we are answerable to God for our failure to warn the world. As one by one our liberties start to erode, this will become harder and harder to do. And the question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to stand like the three Israelites on that plain of Durham and they stood for God? Are we going to bend the knee halfway so we don't get thrown in the fiery furnace? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are examples of what we should be.
with the yoke of bondage. So only Christ can give us freedom. Right? Only Christ can give us freedom. So what happened is that when we look at what's going on around us, we see a lot of turmoil, and Christ spoke about it in his word. And when we look at the three angels' message, our three angels' messages in Revelation um, 14, verses 6 to 12, we see here it says, if you care to follow me, it says, And I saw another, another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So we have a great work to do, right? And God gives us freedom. And this country was basically founded on freedom, right? We go back to the First Amendment where it says here, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So we have four freedoms there. Religious freedom, Freedom of speech, as a matter of fact, it's, it's five. Freedom of speech, we have freedom of the press, for us to peaceably assemble, and also to petition the government for redress of any grievance. And we're looking at what's going on around us. As what Brother Roy said, the lady wanted to publish or to print something to, to give it out. She was um, being barred from doing that, right? And then when we look at what's going on, we see we're in Revelation 13, verse 17, where we'll be um, having a problem unless we have the mark of the beast we can't buy ourselves, right? So where should we be at this time? Where, we sh where should we be when that happens, right? Everywhere we look, we see a lot of construction going on. People are being condensed in a smaller area, right? And if we are in the midst of everything, there's going to be a lot of confusion. We have road rage. We have impatience. And if you measure what's going on around you by what's going on in the city, what's going on in the country, it's two different scenarios. Everyone calls to you in the country. When you're in the city, I pass you, you pass me. We hardly speak to each other, right? And if Christ has set us free, doesn't he say we should also love one another? One another? Yes. So if we are going to be on Christ's side, we have to show Christ. And in the cities, we see more parks being built, more housing, more entertainment. And when we partake in these things, hear the sounds, see the different sights, we are drawn away from God. And in so doing, we actually are siding with the enemy and losing our religious liberty. It says, religious liberty is the first liberty granted to us by God and protected by the First Amendment to our Constitution. And when we look at what's going on also with the Department of Health and Human Services, the Affordable Health Care Act, it also infringes on our religious liberty because employers have to give us the... Um, the plans that it will also give us um, different medications that are against our religious liberty. We are sponsoring abortions, um, different things, and um, 
what happens is that it's either you take it or you're punished. Is that infringing on our religious liberty? Right? So what happens is that uh, we have been encouraged to move to the country where we can grow our own provisions. We got to learn natural remedies and be dependent more on God. When we look at the government, a government that's big enough to give you all that you want is big enough to take all that you have. Right? And I was looking at a presentation by Pope Benedict the 16th sometime in 2012. And what happened, there was discrimination against small churches where um, the New York City adopted a policy that barred Bronx household, um, household of faith and other small churches that were renting from public schools, like on the weekends. And what happened is that um, they decided not to rent the churches, the public buildings for their services. But at the same time, they were renting the same buildings to many other groups that were using them for different occasions. So they are also infringing on people's religious liberty, even though they are working with those who are having like entertainment and so on. We have to look at what's going on around us, right? And look at the word of God where Christ himself um, said many things, right? What happened is Christ spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem. And there was a gentleman, it's found in great controversy, um, page, I think it's page 29 and 30, where it says here, all predictions given by Christ concerning the destruction of Jerusalem were fulfilled to the letter. Said so there's a man that walked up and down the streets of Jerusalem for seven years declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. He was imprisoned, he was scourged, but no complaint ex escaped his lips. To insults and abuse, he answered only, woe, woe to Jerusalem. He was slain in the siege that he foretold. We are seeing all these signs around us, but are we heeding them? We see a lot of construction, as I said before, and what we see is that, like the slogan is, live, work, and play. There is one part in particular in, um, in a city um, in Gwinnett County where they have the 24-hour gym, you have the private parking, like a, um, elevated parking. You get out from the parking and go over to your apartment. You have the dog park, the dog spa. Then you have the entertainment just next door. So everyone is being put together, right? So do we hear a voice telling us that there is going to be the destruction of the city? Are we still looking at what's going on, look at what the Bible has said, every word that Christ has spoken is true. Let us be mindful of what's going on around us. Going on further, it says, none of the Christians perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had given his disciples warning and all who believed his words watched for the promised sign. In Luke 21 verses 20 to 22 it says, when ye shall see Jerusalem come past about with the armies, then know that desolation draweth nigh. Then let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains. 
and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. For, there are day, for these are days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Let us be mindful of what we are seeing. Every time an incident comes up, we say, we say our religious liberty is being taken away. But are we holding firmer to the hand of God? Will we be like the Hebrews who stood? Are we compromising little by little each day? If we keep compromising each day, it will not be anything hard for us to compromise when the days come when we can't buy or sell. If we are sick, we have to bow to get our medications. Let us be faithful to what God has given us in his word. Every word proves true. Let us hold on to it and it's time for us to stand. And if we are not telling someone about Christ and what is coming and stand for the truth, we will not be able to stand. May we give ourselves to the Lord that we will be faithful to every word that he has spoken to us. Happy Sabbath, church. It's, uh, I don't know whose idea this was. I think it was mine, actually, <laughs> to uh, put four individuals who are, on an average, long-winded. <laughs> but uh, God will be faithful and help us to present this message in a timely fashion. Why focus on religious liberty issues in the nation? What is religious liberty? Brother Lance uh, started to give a definition. Religious liberty is freedom to worship by precept and practice according to the dictates of your conscience. Question is, is that under threat? And will that be under threat as time progresses? And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should, not both, uh, should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This is definitely a religious liberty problem right here. Who, what happens to those who do not worship the image? They are threatened with death at the very least. And what happens to those, perhaps, that actually do worship the image? The stakes are high. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth 
the mark of his name. No matter how dire the situation looks, it's actually infinitely worse for anybody who actually takes the mark. The question is, what side are we going to be on? Persecution or religious liberty issue is not a new thing in Christianity. In every age from apostolic times and onward, Christ's loyal followers were being compelled to act contrary to the dictates of their conscience. And of course, we see that with Paul. He was scourged and imprisoned multiple times. We see that with Peter. They uh, put him in prison because he was preaching about Jesus. And what did he say in response? He said, we ought to obey man. I mean, we ought to obey God rather than man. That's where we got to be. I want to focus on religious liberty during the period known as the Dark Ages. Revelation 13.1 And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. We know this to be the papacy, correct? Now, of course, there's many lovely Catholic people, but we're not talking about the people, we're talking about the system, amen? The Bible warns them about, about an apostate system. It says in chapter 13, it described another beast, like unto a leopard, in which the dragon gave his power and his seat and great authority. This symbol, as most Protestants have believed, represents the papacy, which succeeded to the power and seat and authority once held by ancient Roman Empire. So this is no new thing. Protestants from the very beginning, even the, uh, even you talk about Martin Luther, John Wycliffe, uh, Swingley, and uh, John Calvin, all these folks knew, not only from experience, but from the scripture, that the papacy was the Antichrist. Of the leopard-like beast, it is declared, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Talking about a religious liberty issue here now. And to overcome them. And power was given unto uh, him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This prophecy, which is nearly identical with the description of the little horn of Daniel 7, unquestionably points to the papacy. Power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Says the prophet, I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death. And again, he that leadeth into captivity shall go, in, shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. The time was coming to an end of the reign of the Dark Ages, in which papacy ruled with an iron fist. This period, as stated in the preceding chapter, began with the supremacy of the papacy in 538 and terminated in 1798. At that time, the Pope was made captive by the French army. The papal power received its deadly wound and the prediction was fulfilled, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Will history repeat itself in this nation? The thing that has been is that which shall be, and the thing with that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9 And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he had two horns like a lamb. The lamb-like horns indicate youth, innocence, and gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States when presented in the, uh, to the prophet as coming up in 1798. Among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. 
their views now in place in the Declaration of Independence, which sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the Constitution guarantees to the people the right of self-government, providing that representatives elected by the popular vote shall enact and administer laws. Freedom of religious faith was also granted every man being permitted to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. Republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of this nation. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. The oppressed and the downtrodden thought Christendom had turned to this land with interest and hope. Millions have sought its shores and the United States has risen to a place among the most powerful nations of the earth. If the lamb-like qualities represent those principles of religious freedom that found its way into our Constitution, then what does it mean when the beast speaks as a dragon? It must be contrary to the lamb-like qualities which found its way into the Constitution. So the laws that it speaks must also contradict the principles established in the Constitution. How does the nation speak by its laws? Signs of the times and the stories they tell. The signs that inspiration warns about are not isolated incidents. They have an intellectual and emotional effect on our nation and the entire world, and they help usher in final events. So when you look at the signs, you're not looking this is just happening. You're not just merely saying, oh, Jesus is coming, is near. They actually play a role in ushering in end times events. They have a bigger picture in which they're part of, and that's how we look at it. <clears throat> An increase in natural disasters, disease, wars, and rumors of wars. What story might this tell? We have the hurricanes that recently hit. You know, Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irene, and, and others. And we have the natural disaster that took place in Mexico, the earthquakes that took place there. Now we have the wildfires also in California. All these things are not isolated incidents. They're happening in close proximity to each other. Now who do evangelicals typically blame for this problem? Well, who's really, who's really the cause? It's Satan. Kirk Cameron, you know this person? Foremost, he used to be on Growing Pains and, you know, that show back in the day. And uh, he's, the form, he's one of the foremost spokespersons for evangelical Christianity today. It says, God sent hurricanes to punish us. While appearing to the children of men as, great, as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster upon popular cities uh, uh, until popular cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now, he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land and great conflagrations and fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms and tempest floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. That word, conflagrations, means fire, you know, um, fires. And then, the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that has been revoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought the calamities which will not cease until Sunday observers shall be strictly enforced. That's where it's headed. What other signs do we have? A decrease in moral of society on all levels. America's accelerating decay, the National Review says. This author writes, as the steepening decline is evident in the family 
in education, in morality, in art. Anyone who loves America, not only because, as someone who loves America, not only because I am American, but even more so because I know and believe, not believe, know that the American experiment is forming a decent society, and forming a decent society has been most successful in history. I write the following words with sadness, with few exceptions, every aspect of American life is in the decline. Decay is the word. Shockingly, Laura Ingram doesn't see a government solution to the Las Vegas massacre. That's Fox News correspondent. It says, she, she says, we say, well, there is a government solution to every human problem. I would say no. She continued before apparently blaming America's decaying moral values for the attack. We've done a lot to kick Christianity, God to the curb in a society, she said. We can talk a lot about climate change and all these wonderful things in school, but we can't say a simple prayer, even have a moment of silence in a lot of schools today. You have to understand, there is not a government solution to every problem, Ingram reiterated. I would agree with everything she said. But little do they know that that's not where it's headed. Evangelicals, according to prophecy, according to Revelation 13, says the exact opposite. Yet this class puts forth the claim that the fast spread of corruption is largely attributed to the desecration of the so-called Christian Sabbath, and that the enforcement of Sunday observance would greatly improve the morals of society. This claim is especially urged in America, where the doctrine of the true Sabbath has been most widely preached. Here, the temperance work, one of the most prominent and important of moral reforms, is often combined with Sunday movement, and the advocates of the latter represent themselves as laboring to promote the highest interests of society, and those who refuse to unite with them are denounced as the enemies of temperance and reform. Attacks on the Constitution of the United States. Remember this issue? Supreme Court Justice Scalia was one of the nine judges that sat on the panel that, panel that oversaw this case. He was one of four dissenters, and um, he's also known for his expertise in constitutional law. He's, he's esteemed even amongst his colleagues on the panel that he resided on for, this, uh, for that uh, expertise. He says, today's decree says that my ruler and the ruler of 320 million Americans coast to coast is a majority of nine lawyers on the Supreme Court. The opinion in these cases is the furthest extension in fact and the furthest extension one can even imagine of the court's claim power to create liberties that the Constitution and its amendments neglect to mention. This practice of constitutional revision by an unelected committee of nine always accompanies, as it is today, by extravagant praise of liberty, robs the people of the most important liberty they asserted in the Declaration of Independence and won in the Revolution of 1776, the freedom to govern themselves. We're surprisingly close to our first constitutional convention since 1787. Bad idea. Who knows what a constitutional convention is? That's basically a con when the states get together to amend and to change law uh, amendments within the Constitution. Hasn't been done since 1787. Why might it be a bad idea? This is James Madison. In gen in gen if a general conference convention were taking place for the allowed and sole purpose of revising the Constitution, it would naturally consider itself having greater latitude. Let me skip down. It would probably consist of the most heterogeneous characters. So if these states got together, he says, it would probably consist of the most heterogeneous characters would be the most, would be the very focus of that flame which has already too much heated men of all parties. And it would no doubt contain individuals of insidious views who under the mask of seeking alterations popular to some part, but inadmissible to other parts of the Union, might have a dangerous opportunity of sapping the very foundations 
of the fabric. It says, how close are we to this constitutional convention? There are now 27 states in which the legislature has passed resolutions calling for a convention that would propose a balanced budget. Two thirds of the state threshold for calling a convention is 34. We're close. It says, a larger group of critics whose strange bedfellows include the Birchers and American Civil Liberties Union and Common Cause have focused on the risk of a runaway convention veering off into non-budgetary topics. The opportunity to propose amendments without the normal hurdle of getting them past two-thirds of the majority of the House and Senate might prove hard for ideologues to resist. It doesn't need to go to the Senate. The President doesn't need to sign off on it. It just needs to be voted on. Would conservative delegates really vote against, say, a separate amendment asserting that the protection of citizens start at conception? When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman Empire, when she shall reach across the abyss to clasp the hands of spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provisions for the propagations of falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that this time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and that the end is near. Are you ready? Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed to the earth, and so that the, there, would, there would have to be a getting ready among those who have of late embraced the third angel's message. Said the angel, get ready, get ready, get ready. You will have to die a greater death to the world than you have yet died. I saw that there was a great work for them to do, but a little time in which to do it. Are we getting ready, brothers and sisters? And how do we get ready? We gotta look, just like Jesus. We have to spend that time in devotion, constantly in prayer, examining our own hearts, so that God himself will prepare us for what's to come. Amen? Amen. Saving is trying to even make me more nervous than I am. The Saints today, um, Brother Sykes is going to help me um, go through this information. It's a lot of information, and I have 15 minutes. So with that said, um, I'm going to kneel and pray, and we'll get to it. Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I'm not worthy, but by your strength, you will bring back to memory what I should say, that you want me to say, dear God. 
Bless us all. Give us the strength to stand in these days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. But we're looking now at the culmination of everything that you've heard today. And you'll be looking at what the Vatican has in store for us. <clears throat> Want to step back in time a little bit and um, anybody knows who this person is? This person is John Wesley, and he's the founder of the Methodist Church. And Brother Sykes is going to read a snippet on what he thought about the papacy. Yes, as Stephen the papacy said, he is a in the radical sense of man of sin, and he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is, too, properly stated the son of perdition as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers, he it is that exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship, claiming the highest power and the highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. Now this is the founder of the Methodist Church, and this is what he believed through scripture. What he thought that the papacy was. Let's listen to what the Methodist Church think now today. And read the first, first and the last. United Methodists and other Methodists offer prayers and warm wishes to both princes. For the folk, first folk from the Americas, who now will set the tongue of the Roman Catholic Church's ecumenical relations with other Christian traditions. We, the people of the United Methodist Church, are ready to continue the journey with the Roman Catholic Church, praying for one another, staying in a respectful dialogue with one another, knowing of the differences of believing that Christ unites us. Wow. Can we believe that? Now, the next one we'll go to. Do anybody know who's this guy? This is Thomas Kramer. He is one of the founders of the Anglican Church. And let's hear what he had to say. Where I call Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other churches, all writers and strong reasons. This is the Anglican Church today. <clears throat> And uh, just, we're going to just look at the statement that is on top. Pope Francis meets the members of the Anglican Church, Roman Catholic International Commission. So the Anglican Church formed a commission with the Roman Catholic Church. And what that commission is all about? Hmm. The commission is about uniting the whole Christian, whole Christian world churches together under the banner of Rome. <clears throat> Anybody knows who's this guy? This is Martin Luther, <clears throat> the founder of the Lutheran Church. Well, let's hear what he had to say. For who is a man of sin and a son of perdition? But he who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church, while he yet sits in the church as if he were God. All these 
missions have now for many ages been fulfilled by the papal tyranny. Amen. Now this is the Lutheran Church. This is one of the founders of the Lutheran Church, one of the leaders. And now today, the Lutheran Church is ecstatic about uniting with Rome. And in fact, they have signed a document stating that the 90 theses that Martin Luther nailed on the, on the doors of Lindenburg, they are done away with. So this is what the Lutheran Church has to say. Brothers and sisters, we are in trouble if we are not united under God. This is Pope Francis. And uh, he is greeting, he sends out greetings to all the churches in unification. Oh. And this is what he said. Dear brothers and sisters, the vision is a wound in the body of Christ, body of the church of Christ, and we not want this wound to remain open. The vision is the work of the Father of lies, the Father of this school, who does everything possible to keep us alive. Did you hear what he just said? Division is a wound, and it is caused by the father of lies. Hmm. If I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> I thought the Reformation was started by men being moved by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God. You realize what he just did? He just committed the impardonable sin. That is <clears throat> calling the Holy Spirit Beelzebub or the devil. This is a picture of many leaders in the world. The picture in the back is all the angelical leaders, all the big names, pretty much all of them. And um, they're united with the Pope. <clears throat> Even Joel Osteen, when he went to visit the Pope, he took this guy with him. This guy is the leader of the Mormon church. And so you can see, Satan is mustering his troops. My brother read this before, and uh, we'll read it again. The Protestants of the United States will be fools in stretching their hands across the belt to God's hand, to grab their hands seriously. They will reach over the abyss to craft hands of their own power. And under the influence of this mutual union, the country will follow on the steps of Rome and trample on the rights of conscience. Rome is uniting the world under the power of spiritualism. By the power of spiritualism, Rome is building together her bringing together her daughters to unite with her at the end of this time. We're going to go quickly to Revelation 13, 3.
as you dare say amen. amen. And I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and he made all the world wonder after the beast. So we can see the whole world as, Ro as Rome is healing, the whole world is wondering after the beast. <clears throat> this is a, a diagram of the early church, the apostle church. And this is where all the split up happened in the church. Uh, the Greeks, the Greek Orthodox Church, which is this guy here. I don't know if anybody knows this guy, but he is. Anybody knows this guy? He's Prince Bartholomew. He's the leader of the. Uh, he's the leader of the. Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church split up before the Reformation. They separated from Rome long before the Refor Reformation. But now you can see today, Brother Sykes. Pope Francis left Yes, please. Francis represents 1.2 million strong Catholic church, and Bartholomew, the spiritual leader of the world's 300 million Orthodox Christians, called for constructive dialogue with Islam based on mutual respect and friendship. Amen. As you can see, Satan is mustering his forces by bringing in all the Christian churches throughout the world. By the way, look at this cane. <laughs> it's, it's a fitting picture. Two dragons meeting, uniting, I should say. Does anybody know who this guy is? Because you can see what it says. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, you got it? Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. Geo, from the Secretary General of 600 million member of the World Government of Alliance, WBA. Yes. He, in one swoop, the Pope was able to unite 300, 300 million to the Orthodox Church. In another swoop, he was able to unite 600 million. Could anybody tell me <clears throat> how much people, how much members are in the Adventist church? Approximately 17, 18 million. So through the auspices of spiritualism, Rome is gathering forces. Why is Rome gathering forces? You might ask. <clears throat> Rome is gathering forces so that through religious liberty, they can pass a Sunday law. The more people you have, when they cry out to the governments of this world, they must pass a Sunday law. This is how close we are, brother. This is how close we are. <clears throat> this when I read this, this was really heartbreaking for me. Even the Waldenses are coming together with Rome. The Waldenses were persecuted by the thousands, children, women, 
and now today they're even coming together. So you can see that Rome is gathering its forces. In the interest of time, I'm going to go through, slip through some of these. My finger is nervous, <laughs> so I can't find, okay. I wondered to myself, could this at really affect the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Could the people of God, even the very elect, could there be disrupted by this power of spiritualism? Hmm. Has anybody ever heard about the One Project Movement? Well, the Rome Project movement was a movement. You said it's closed now? Praise God. <laughs> um, that I didn't know. But the Rome Project movement is a movement that their motto is the same motto as the Catholic Church. That's Jesus all, Jesus all. No doctrine, no law, just Jesus. <clears throat> now, what these guys do is they go around to all our colleges, I mean all our colleges, and they infiltrate our colleges with the poison of Satan to the One Project Movement. I had an experience with this personally. One of my wife and us and me, our dear friends, one of our dear friend's son, he went to Andrews. And we had a discussion. He came, he was telling me about, you know, the um, contemplative prayer and all of that, and I was trying to explain to him, this is spiritualism. But it shows you that how deep and how serious spiritualism is. And Satan is using this, this demon, to infiltrate the whole world and bring it under his, his, um, his auspices. Now, this is what he had to say. This is the words that he had to say. Could you read it for me, please? To remain free, we must be fed from many streams. Others must meet our truth. We must go beyond our nomination. Wow. And this is what he's been, this is what they've been going to our, our schools and teaching our youth. <clears throat> that we, uh, we must feed from other streams. Well, the only other stream that we could feed from besides God's word is Satan. And that's not good. When Rome unites all the churches together, which is pretty much, we just went through it. The Lutheran churches, all the churches are united are not uniting, but united with the Roman power. When this happened, they all will go with one tune. As brother, my brother was saying, and this is how Satan is going to use it. The degraded morals, calamities, which is all that's going on now, and then through the power of spiritualism, he will unite the whole world, the whole Christian world, to ask for Sunday sacredness, a Sunday law. Brothers and sisters, do you see how close we are? No, I mean, seriously, do you see how close we are? This is where the world is at. This is beyond the United States of America. This is where we are. Right around the corner, it's a Sunday law coming. 
and Satan is gathering his troops. Brothers, I, I, it, it, it really, it really just, oh no, I'm going too far now. <laughs> okay. But God didn't leave us staring up in the sky and wondering. Could you read for me? Do you hear what the Lord, the servant of the Lord just said? Everything that she just said is happening now. What's the Holy Covenant? Could anybody tell me what the Holy Covenant is? Brother Sykes? That's right. The Holy Covenant is the law of God. And she says, in Daniel, I mean, she, she, I got the um, all, all, but I, I don't have time to give you all of the, the comments. Um, she said that in the 11th chapter in Daniel, from 30 to 36, she describes everything that will transpire in this world at the end times. Now, we just heard from 30, and 31, it is literally here. We are here. Sure. You can. <laughs> okay. Well, you could, okay, just let me finish and then you can come in. Yeah. Um, we are here, brothers and sisters, um, but God didn't leave us in the dark. As you know, God is all will bring us into light through his word. And you see in the, in the chapter, 11th chapter of Daniel, it describes everything that I just explained to you about the unification of all the churches in this world. As I said, he will forsake and he will go against the Holy Covenant, and then he will have intelligence with those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Well, do the churches keep the Ten Commandments? Which church keeps the Ten Commandments? There's only one. That's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. All of the other churches have forsaken the Holy Covenant. So can two walk together or lest they be agreed? So as we can see, all of the churches are in agreement with the Catholic Church. Now as they come together a muster They, in fact, this is, this is Daniel uh, 11, where she talks about what, what's going to happen or what's happening, which we just talked about, so I'm just going to skip that. Uh, I guess that's it. But like I said, this is where Rome is, brothers and sisters. This is where the world is. <clears throat> How shall we stand in that great day? Will we be left wanting? Or shall we stand as the Lord soldiers? Because, now let me tell you, the Lord is also mustering his soldiers. Amen. And he is looking for a few 
good men and women <clears throat> here in Advent Hope. <clears throat> in all the Seventh-day Adventist churches, he's looking for a few good men and women. But the Lord cannot use soldiers that are wounded. Why? Because a wounded soldier cannot be fit for battle. And when I say wounded, the only thing that can wound these soldiers is sin. So when we are wounded by the wounds of sin, we are not fit to be soldiers in God's army. <clears throat> so to end what I was, there's so much more information I, I want to share with you guys, so much more. But by God's grace, maybe another time. But as I would like to say, God is mustering his army, and he's looking for all of us here to come under his banner. But the only way that we can do it is to forsake sin. Allow our great general, I like how Moses called him, a man of war. Allow our great general to cleanse us and prepare us for what's about to come. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> this is not my element right here. This is not. I prefer to be back there behind the equipment. But as a part of the Religious Liberty Group, my brothers stand, all my brothers stand up, so obviously I would have to too. I cannot deny my post because then I would be saying, <clears throat> when God asks, send me, I would be saying, no, don't send me. And that would be going against God. So with the help of my brother, Brother Sykes, and uh, the help of all you here at Evan Hope, <clears throat> I hope that the Lord has given you um, what he wanted to present through me. And as, uh, as we close, I will ask if everyone here <clears throat> think, want to be a, a soldier in God's army, would you please stand? God is a God of war. We are at war with Satan. He is meaning to take every last one of us down and our children. May God help us. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we, your servants, come to you, Father, for you to cleanse us, dear God, make us clean. Give us clean hands and a pure heart so that we can receive the latter rain, dear God, and carry out the final work. May we become special forces in your mighty hand. We pray now, as I pray to you, dear God, please grant me this prayer according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. Brother Sykes, come in. But um, it, is, it wasn't a question. It wasn't a question, it was a comment. Um, I think another reason why a lot of people are moving towards spiritualism is because there's a lot of people, especially men, doing things in God's name that is causing war and hate and strife that God did not say to do. Um, I think sometimes, we, even I have done this, we can get wrapped up in trying to share God and blah, 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 but sometimes we can um, forget.
forget how to speak to people, yes. how to talk to people, and then, because even I have some friends that are like, you know, religion causes war, I don't want to be involved in religion, and because it's not God that they're seeing, it's people doing things, you know, even the Bible says, um, it is, we're not warring against flesh and blood, but through principalities and blah, and so, um, my former husband, before I got divorced, is from Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, and there's a lot of things going on there, like in the Middle East, a lot of hatred and blah, 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 and he hates it there. Like, unfortunately, he has, he has to be there, well, doesn't have to, because he's not a U.S. citizen. But um, I've heard some people, even my friends, Zada, that lives over there, they, they just feel like they want to die. They, they don't want to live, because they don't even want to be there, because they're tired of religion. Yeah. You know, like, religion there is very conservative, Islam, of course. Yes. But um, if you go to places like Qatar, other places, some is more, more or less lenient, but Saudi Arabia is the street, one of the strictest countries, um, um, I say Islam, Islamic countries, and so a lot of people I know, they're looking at religion like it is the cause of all of this, you know what I mean, like, we don't want to be involved, I mean, like, you know, and I can't blame them for how they feel, but I think it goes back to the things that we're doing in the name of God, uh -huh. not, you know, like, it's not God, I'm trying to get him to realize it's not God, you know what I mean? Like, it's, the, it's what man is doing in the name of God. Right. Trying to, like, God didn't ask us to be, like, his prosecutor. Right. You know, like, I mean, he didn't ask us to be, like, his prosecutors or anything like that. I mean, that's what we choose to do sometimes. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I'm fighting for the Lord. i got to fight him down. And I mean, he asks us to share, share the gospel. I mean, like, sometimes I think we can do a little bit too much, <laughs> too much. And it's causing people to think that, all this hatred is coming from the Father, but it's not. So I think that's another reason why, especially my age group, is starting to move towards the spiritualism thing, because they're seeing like, well, when we look at religion, there's all this hate and people saying this and that, so I'd rather be spiritual. I'm not, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. You know what I mean? Like, because it's, it's a safer, um, for them a safer, what do you call it? Like, thing to be a part of, you know what I mean? Like, you know, so that's all I want to say. Sorry. But, but um, I'm going to answer to you about that. Um, and this is something called, this is something that was developed by the Jesuits. And it's called the Hegelian dialectic. This is what they do. They take one principle and force it against another principle, like religion. And then they bring out something a little easier and force it against religion. And then make you choose which one you want. Usually, then you'll choose the easier one because that's how life really is. That's how we are set up, to, to choose the easy way. And that's what they're doing. It's called the Hegelian dialectic, where they take one religion and force it upon another religion. And then the most calmest one you'll take, of course. But... That's right. But, um, you know, there's some... And, this, and this, this, is all be, this is all being done by the Catholic Church, behind the scenes. We'll talk a little bit more about it if you want to. Okay, thank you. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion bright and blessed, he, Christ, he'll prepare for us a place.
pray now that as we go through the rest of the Sabbath, that you keep our hearts, Father. Every seed that you've planted in everyone here and those who are already listening, we pray that you will not allow the devil to wash these seeds away, but pray that they flourish and grow into, into us that we might join you in your kingdom. At the end of all of this, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Remember you, everybody here, guests, visitors, our potluck is still part of our worship and Advent home. You may be seated. The hymn number 678 is part. 679, right, please. God be 